You guys are here this morning, and we're going to start off the best way to start any morning, in, in my opinion, uh, with musical worship, and an opportunity for us to, to kind of posture our hearts and our minds uh, to the Lord, to come in. I know we come in with different weeks every week, whether it's a low, a high, we're going through some um, tough things in life, but every single time uh, we come into this space, it's kind of like God invites invites us to recenter a little bit, to come before him with everything that we have, to lay it at his feet, and to be encouraged in our souls because of who he is, to be reminded that he truly is an amazing God. Now this morning, real quick, I want to I wanna read from the book of Philippians in chapter 2. This is our God. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Um, and I love that passage because it shows us the heart of God. It shows us that what kind of God uh, that we serve, a God who loves so much that he uh, sent his son to come and to be humbled to the point of a servant, to the point of death on the cross, that he is the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world, but he truly is also the lion of Judah, the conquering lion who is victorious. And it says here that one day every knee will bow before the lion. And so this morning, um, I invite you to just continue to think about who God is, who Jesus is, uh, and give him praise because there's no one like our God. There's no one that ever even compares to him. And we're going to give him his due honor and glory this morning. So let's worship.
repeats over and over again, who can stop the Lord Almighty? But we ask that question not because we don't know, it's because no one, no one can stop the Lord Almighty. So let's sing this with confidence, knowing who he is. Who can stop? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Lord Jesus, we thank you for who you are this morning. Lord, we thank you that you are so great. You're greatly to be praised. And in your word, it does say that everything has breath. Praise the Lord. And this morning, Lord, we just want to do that. We want to give you honor and glory and praise. We thank you for being God Almighty, creator of the universe, giver of life, and love and joy, the source of all things. We give you praise this morning. You give life.
You 
again thank you for who you are we just want to say and sing and declare in this place again and again that we just love you we love you so much Lord we want to give you everything we want to give you our time and our money and our families and our jobs and everything in our lives we want to give to you because you are God and you are worthy of it all And so this morning, Lord, would you continue to be with us? Would you continue to meet us here and be glorified by the reading of your word and the singing and the worship of your people, Lord? We love you so much. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. May all be seated. I'd like to invite Yvonne up for Community Life. Good morning, CLC. How are you all doing? Happy Sunday. All right. So I'm here to do community life. My name is Yvonne, in case you didn't know me. Hello. All right, so our mission statement. We at CLC, we are, our mission statement is to make disciples who love God, love people, and... All right, that's right. Okay, so um, one of the many ways we can thank God is through our giving and giving especially of our time and our tithes and offerings. So in front of you in your chairs, there's these little QR codes or these little blue cards that show multiple ways that you can give. And if you'd like to support our ministry that God is doing here at CLC, you can give through the app by scanning the QR code to to the left or text the amount to the number on the screen. There's, there's actually three ways, but you could check which, which QR code you like, okay? All right, so home groups. How many of you are in a home group? Raise your hand. Wow, majority, that's awesome. All right, if you're not in the home group, what I'd like to invite you to consider it. Um, it's, a net, it's a step towards growing your faith, and it's really cool because here, well, you get to see each other, but you really build deeper community when you're with your home group in a smaller group. You, you're surrounded with people going in the same direction. You're spending time as a, as a small group to do Bible study, prayer, encouragement, and have some fun. And I know a lot of home groups love to eat, and bring, they take great turns and great meals, as I remember. Uh, so I encourage you, if you're interested in joining, please, um, please contact Pastor Eric and he'll connect you to one of the home groups, okay? So this is actually very interesting. The next one is about Pendo's power. How many of you have heard about Pendo's power? Oh, lots, okay. So the book launch is coming on November 4th. It's, a, it's um, 
It's driven by Freely and Hope, who's our sister organization that supports CLC. We're excited to invite you to the launch, which is November 4th, and it's the first children's book that prevents sexual abuse. So it's geared towards children, eight, um, children from four to 10, and it teaches um, children to be, what are age appropriate concepts about consent, body autonomy, safe touch, and the power of their voice. So um, there is a book launch on November 4th from two to four at the Children's Creativity Museum in San Francisco. So if you'd like to launch, go and support, you can do that. You could also go purchase a book, okay? And I'm gonna invite Steven to come up for the child dedications. Yeah, that, that'll work, that'll work. <laughs> close, close. Well, now I ruined it. Uh, yes, yeah, so we have a child dedication today. I'd like to invite up Dave, Wendy, and Will, as well as Ed, Cindy, and Chase. Come on up to the stage. You can go ahead and give them a round of applause. Uh, so I think many of you probably know these families. They've been around COC for a long time. Um, if you don't know them, introduce yourself. They're wonderful people. Um, and their kids are wonderful as well. So uh, there's Will right there. He's got two older brothers. Uh, there you go, Matthew and Jack, say hi. And Chase also has two older brothers. We got Curry and we got Clay right there, say hi. Uh, and they're really awesome. Uh, I actually looked up what their names mean. I was just curious, you know, there's a lot of meaning and power behind a name. And so I looked up Will, and Will is a strong-willed warrior. I thought that's probably pretty fitting knowing his brothers. <laughs> uh, very fitting, very fitting, you kind of have to be. It also means royal protector as well, though. And I thought that was also fitting. Um, just, just knowing his relationship with his brothers. I, I think that might be a, a sort of prophetic name as he grows up. Uh, now I looked up Chase, and I think it's related to hunting and being a huntsman. So I looked up Adelaide, which is actually her first name. Uh, and it, it has connections to nobility. It's a, of a noble kind, like a princess. And you look at her, right, and like, wow, what a wonderful princess, right? Well, you get to know her a little bit, and she, she can hold her own. She's got two older brothers, okay? She, she is fierce, okay? She's not like a dainty little princess, though she is one. Uh, yeah, see, Clay, Clay's laughing. Clay knows what's up. <laughs> uh, but, but for both of them, as strong as they are, um, I know that there are people who, who love their family, love their older brothers, and um, look out for each other. And, and that goes for you guys as well. So I'm just really honored uh, to be able to do the dedication for them today. Uh, well, what is a, a child dedication? For, for one, it is for uh, the parents, uh, Dave, Wendy, and Ed and Cindy, to make a, a public declaration that they are committing their children to the Lord. And whatever the Lord has planned for their lives, uh, His will on their lives. Uh, it's also just a commitment uh, for them to say that they are going to provide all of the love and the nurture and the training to raise them up in the ways of the Lord. And it's also an opportunity for all of us. This is not um, just for the parents, but it's for us as a church community to also make that commitment to do our part in helping raise these wonderful little people, uh, to show them the love of God and to uh, give them the knowledge of God as they're growing up in their love for him. Uh, so with that, I just have uh, a few questions for the parents, and you can answer in the affirmative if, if you agree. And then one last one uh, for the rest of us at the end. Uh, so first, Dave, Wendy, and Ed and Cindy, have you as parents accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and have you committed your lives to him? Yes. Do you dedicate your children to God, recognizing that they are a gift from God and affirming his lordship over their lives? Will you commit yourselves to maintain a Christ-centered marriage and to establish a godly home for your children? Will you endeavor to diligently teach your children the commandments and the promises of the Lord so that each child may grow into the love 
and nurture and admonition of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. All right, thank you. And for all of you who are here today, do all of you witnessing this dedication commit yourselves to supporting these families and to welcoming these children into the life of this church, remembering the words of the, our Lord that whoever receives a little child receives the Lord himself. If so, say we do. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Um, with that, I would just like to pray a, a prayer blessing over, over the kids. Well, Father, it it truly is a gift that you've given Chase and Will to us to be a part of our family, um, certainly to their their actual respective biological families, but for all of us here um, that we can just enjoy them and and the people that they are and to to see them grow up in their love for you. God, I I ask that uh, you would give your grace to, uh, to the parents, to Dave and Wendy and Ed and Cindy as as they are doing their best in their commitment to uh, honor you, honor their roles as parents, uh, that, that you've put them in charge of uh, these people's lives. And that is a huge responsibility. And, and I know they feel the weight of it, so I'm asking that you uh, give them grace and power uh, to do exactly that, that they would uh, give them everything that they need to, to live good and full lives, that they would uh, not exasperate their children or discourage them, uh, but, but lead them in your way. And I, I also ask that you would give uh, grace to the kids themselves, uh, that they would obey their parents, uh, knowing that if they do, uh, it will go well for them. And, and that is a promise that you give. So God, um, witness our dedication today. Uh, may it be a pleasing act of worship to you and uh, continue to be with these wonderful families. We pray this all in the power and the authority of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, why don't you give him a hand? So uh, we can go ahead and dismiss the kids and the youth to their classes and pass Eric for the message. There is, uh, there is nothing better than the third child, the battle-tested third child, the spoiled battle-tested third child. I stand before you also today with an older brother and sister. Um, and there's nothing better when you grow up to be bigger than both of them. <laughs> and so, uh, well, this morning we're going to, uh, we're continuing our series on Luke. Um, and um, if you remember the theme of Luke is that um, Jesus calls us to repent, that the good news of God is here. And wherever we're at, um, God is always calling us deeper into who he is and to where his mission is. And so much of the gospel is centered on calling people to turn and walk in God's direction. And the most difficult part, I think sometimes, is when uh, we are convinced that we're going in God's direction, right? Uh, And you know, how how much of our culture, how much of our faith, how much of our rhythms go in that direction. And the one thing we'll find in the gospels and all the stories is Jesus is always calling people into deeper relationship. And most of the time we have these stumbling blocks within our own, within our own hearts. Um, and so there's these places where we have to, uh, we always have to turn. And so many of the stories and the four people and the four, um, four people and four stories in, in our series has been watching people come to this place of going, oh, I guess I was facing a little bit or a lot in the wrong direction. The overall theme though, that Jesus is coming and saying, and if you've ever re- read the gospels or in our faith, you'll notice that there is always an overall theme is that Jesus is calling everybody to the gospel. And we think about that as like a package or something, but it really is, he's calling them to the good news. And oftentimes, once we get it, we go, this is great. I now have it. And we have a history of holding it to ourselves. The stories we're gonna go through today, we're gonna be talking about 
uh, talking about that, that God is coming back and Jesus is coming back to, hey, what is the original plan? What's the original plan that God has? It's all throughout the Old Testament and New Testament. Do not buy into any of the dualism that says the Old Testament God operated this way. In the New Testament, that is a, um, it is a rookie mistake. It is, it's, a, it's a rookie mistake. Not because God didn't do things differently, but you will see that everything through the Old Testament and the New Testament, uh, salvation was always by faith. That never shifted. God was always patient and loving. That's never shifted. The character of God and the character of his people never changed, even though the circumstances changed. And so we're supposed to be, God gives us this good news, and it's supposed to be transformative. And yet now we live in a world, I don't know if you, like, you watch TV, you get so easy to be overwhelmed. Uh, just even our home group this week, we were talking, like, ugh, it just seems like we're watching churches die and, you know, and it feels like the, you know, the air has been sucked out of the room and the Christian faith. And then people get up and say really dumb things in the name of God. And you're like, oh, what am I, should I be part of this? I love, I love God. I hope today's passage will be encouraging. Let me, let me tell you an encouraging story. So when I worked at city team, we actually had missionaries with city team all over the world. And there were some amazing things that were happening. One of my very good friends that traveled with extensively was one of our head church planners, and his name was Shadanke. And um, Shadanke, um, Shadanke lived in Sierra Leone, and uh, to my knowledge, he still does. I should say that he lived past that. But he lives he lives in Sierra Leone, and he plan, um, and he God has used him in these amazing ways. But he had told me these stories about what happened 20 years ago in the civil war that happened in Sierra Leone, and it was chaos. There was different political factions, um, life became very cheap, people were being killed, there were raw minerals in the country that people were coming in to take. It just, every different kind of you know, headwind that could come in was happening. And as a pastor in that area, he spoke out against some of the atrocities that were happening. Well, one day, um, soldiers show up at his house. He sees them, he's hiding. They find his wife, they go, where, where is Shadanke? We've come to get your husband. She's covering for him. Finally, God goes, no, just go with them. So Shadanke goes, he, he goes and kind of turns himself in, and he says they bind his arms behind his neck really tight, and he goes, and they throw him into the back of the truck, in his own words, like a sack of potatoes. And his wife is in tears, because she knows what this means. She knows that this is not going to end well. So he lifts his head up from the truck, and he says to his wife, honey, I'm going with my new friends. I'll be back by supper. And to which the soldiers then all kick him and, and kick him and, you know, and beat him and then they take him off to, uh, to jail. The jail is at a military outpost complex. And it's not a jail, it's more like a shipping container that they lock him in all day. He's locked in the shipping container. You can imagine a hot, humid place in an old shipping container with no lights. At the end of the day, he knows what's going to happen. Most likely he will be shot and killed. This is what's been happening all throughout the country. Anybody that's even close to being a problem, this is what happens. Um, but when you travel to Shadanke, he is like a character from scripture. So what does he do? He starts singing. He sings all day. And he does this when you travel with him. He sings all the time. He makes songs up and he's got this beautiful voice. And so he's always singing. He sings all day. It's driving the soldiers crazy. They're bang he says they're banging on the thing. He goes, I just keep singing. At the end of the day, he's brought into the general's office. He goes, he goes into the general's office and he says, who are you? Don't you know what's gonna happen? And he says, yes, you're going to kill me. <laughs> And he says, you've been driving my men crazy all day singing. He goes, yeah, I know. I can't help but sing to my Lord. He goes, I'm, I'm not afraid to die. He goes, I have never 
the, the colonel goes, I've never met anybody like you. None of my men are this brave. And so as they talk, and Shadaki explains who he is, this general is a little bit taken with him, a little amused and goes, okay, I'll tell you what, how about this? I'm going to let you go home tonight and then, you know, and then come back tomorrow morning, which is kind of the wink, wink, go, leave, just get off the, get off the horizon, just disappear, right? He's going to spare his life. So Shadanki go, goes home, Ford comes home, he, you know, his wife is in tears, everybody's crying, they're praying, he shows up, he goes, I told you I would be back for dinner. His friends are like, okay, we got to get you out of here. He goes, no. The next morning, he gets up early, goes back to the complex, pounds on the door, the gate. And they're, they bring him into the general's office, and the general looks at him and goes, I don't know if you're smart, if you're, you're like the bravest man I've ever met, or the craziest, dumbest man I've ever met. He said, you told me to come back, so I'm coming back. Then he says, you know, if the men in... The, if the men in my command were as brave as you, in fact, if you were in my army, he goes, you would be a general by now. And he says, well, I'm already in an army. Well, you have to understand how many factions and little armies and guerrilla groups. And so the general, he goes, instantly gets upset. He goes, whose army are you in? And Shanky goes, I'm in the Lord's army, <laughs> right? And God, with God, I have, I have a majority of one. And, and so the general looks at him after talking with some time and says, would you teach my men to be as brave as you are? And so Shidanki starts Bible studies in the military, teaching them how to read scripture. I'm not exaggerating this, unless he was really exaggerating, but he's not, right? And so you, um, because of Shidanki's, um, his, desire to see everybody as a potential person that God loves to spread the gospel. He has seen, uh, he has seen um, people all over Sierra Leone and all over the region come to Christ, most notably Muslims, which have never, the Christian, the Christian church has just been hard ground. And over the last 10 to 15 years, we've seen these great inroads because of people like Shadanka who continue to pursue not just people like them, but continue to pursue people that are completely different. There was a side note in this story I want to share with you because it's, it's kind of this, oh, and then guess, like that was a miracle. And he says still when he walks down this, walks like, like uh, as much as 10 years ago, military officers would salute him because he still has actually respect and standing in the military because they're still using some of, some of his, um, his methods. Well, in 2008, they had an election in Sierra Leone. It kinda, they kind of follow our same election pattern. And the president that was in charge was a Muslim president, and there was a lot of corruption in the government, as Shadanki would tell me. I, I don't know anything about the, you know, the granularity of the Sierra, Sierra, Leone's, we, uh, Sierra Leone, but we know that it, in the UN, it was like one of the lowest places on the misery index because there was a lack of infrastructure after the Civil War, and there was a ton of money coming in and a ton of money being, you know, being taken. One, another, pres another person was running for the presidency. Well, so many villages that used to be Muslim villages had become Christian, that the then Muslim kind of, in, you know, theory political president, when they were walking through the election, they started figuring out that the election was going to be a lot closer than they thought. So he goes to the head of the military and he says to him, we're going to need some help. We probably have to fix this election. And the head of the military is the same general that Shadanki had reached out to 10 years previous. And he says to him, I'm sorry, I can't do that. I'm a follower of Aisa now of Jesus. And I will do everything in the power to make sure the election is fair for you or for them. But I cannot, in, I cannot, I cannot have the military intervene. And the standing president got really mad at him. He says, if I win again, you're, first thing I'm doing is firing you. Well, sure enough, long story, um, uh, the election went off fairly and a new president was elected. 
Um, and um, and, this, and this president, from what I understood, was very hard on that corruption and trying to, trying to weed it out. So you never know when the good news is shared, there sometimes is this ripple effect, right? And that's just one story from one man in a very, uh, in a very hard country. But I always love, there's so many stories that, that, um, that I've experienced with people that will do everything to share the good news of Jesus with not just people that are against them, but people that are their enemies, that they're praying for them, they're moving towards them. So here we come to this passage in Luke, and we're seeing that this is, um, that, uh, that this is a place where Jesus is set on making sure the gospel can go to the whole world. And a couple of weeks ago, I spoke about the, um, if you remember and you were here, I spoke about the widow's might. And the tragedy of the widow's might was not how the woman gave, but it was the temple that was supposed to be taking care of her and other people was actually extracting from her, from her was taking all of her money. And this is why Jesus, uh, Jesus' mission was to say, this temple has to go. It's now standing in the way. Or I say maybe something you never had heard, Jesus was picking a fight with the temple. So today we're going to go over three stories. We're going to do them really quickly. And there are three stories you've probably heard, but Mark puts them together uh, in a way for emphasis. And so if we don't understand why Mark is putting them together, we kind of will look at all three stories and go, oh, that's a great story. Oh, yeah, we tell that one at Easter. And one of the stories, literally, if you don't understand it, it doesn't make any sense. It's just one of those Bible stories you'll read and you'll be like, oh, yeah, Jesus did that. He was a pretty cool guy. But it actually has really deep meaning. And so we're going to be talking, uh, we're going to be going through Mark chapter 11. And if you understand like Mark, we're in chapter 11, the last here we are, it's, Mark is already in chapter 11, just beyond the halfway point of the book. He, he now goes into the last week or two of Jesus's life. So the last week or two of Jesus's life, we have a lot of, this is where so many of the, of the gospel stories. Jesus has a three-year ministry, but it accumulates here, like especially in the book of Mark, it, it accumulates in the, last, in, the, in the last few weeks. And there and, um, and they're all, the way Mark places them and even the order he puts them in, it's all really important. And so today we're going to be talking about what Jesus does. And Mark is going to make this statement that as Jesus heads towards the temple, we think, oh, he's going there to die for our sins. Yes. But he's also going there to free, not only to free us, but to open up the whole world to the good news of God which was originally the promise to Abraham back in, the, back in the Old Testament, that your descendants will be a blessing to all nations. And it wasn't happening. So this is why Jesus is always incensed at the religious leaders, because they were the ones that were supposed to be, they were, they were the ones supposed to be leading that. And it wasn't happening. And so what Mark will do here in the th three stories is that, is that he will make sure that you understand that Jesus is the one. Like, why is he doing this? Well, Jesus has the authority to do it. Now, it's easy to say that, but you know what happens when somebody has influence or authority, right? I mean, is there anybody worse than if you're watching, a, uh, if you're watching sports that you yell at the TV like, I know what to do? I don't know what you're doing here. You should do this or you should do that. I did that all last season watching the Warriors. And, and I was right. Jordan Poole would come in. I'd be, get him out. Get him out. He can't play defense. What are you doing? Look at this. We're, neg we're, we're now down eight, right? So it's easy to do that. It's another thing to hand somebody the whistle on the clipboard and say, okay, you call the game. Uh, like, I don't have any authority, right? But it's different when you do have authority. Like my friends, were, my friends years ago were skiing and... Um, and um, husband and wife, the wife went off, was skiing on the side, hit a tree, hit a, a, a buried log, went over it, head on into a tree. You know, head trauma, big gash. They take her all the way, you know, ski patrol takes her down. The, the husband, you know, is got the, you know, compact on her, holding it all the way down the hill, gets into the ambulance with her. And the EMT looks at him and says, sir, sorry, 
You can't go down the hill in the ambulance. You have to find another way down. And he utters an expression of authority that allows everything to change. He looks at them and says, I'm a neurosurgeon. And the EMT goes, you ride down with him. I will ride in the front. Nothing better than having a neurosurgeon, right, with a head trauma patient. Like, yes, you are, you are far beyond my knowledge of knowing what to do. And so what, what these stories are going, what we're, the, the stories we're about to go through, Mark is, pack, is, is packaging them and stacking them in such a way so we understand what Jesus' authority is. Let's go to the first part. Mark 11, chapter 11, verses 1. We usually tell the story around Easter because it's a great Easter story. It says, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you. And just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And if anyone asks you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord needs it and will send it back here shortly. Then they went and found a colt outside in the street tied to at a doorway. As they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing? Untie, what are you doing? Untying that colt. They answered as Jesus had told them and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw, the, they threw their cloaks over it, He sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road while others spread branches uh, that they they had cut in the fields. Those who went ahead, uh, those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father, David. Hosanna in the highest. So here we have the triumphal emphry. And sometimes you look at that and go, well, I've talked to some Christians at Easter. They'll say, well, at least Jesus got a little thing. He got a little, a little praise before his death. That's not what's happening here. Jesus is fulfilling scripture. But he's coming in as a king. You see, there's three offices, if you would, that Jesus has to, um, he, he fulfills. And if he is in that office, then he has the utmost authority to to do anything he wants. And here's the first one, that he is a king. That Jesus is the king. So he's acknowledging that he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He has a name above every name. That name has authority. And sometimes even as Christians, we never have to be ashamed. The name has authority. The world is spiritual. And the name of Jesus um, in our lives goes a lot further and deeper than anything we can imagine because he is the first and final word. So when he comes in as a king, he's he's actually allowing them to enter into Jerusalem. Now he's been to Jerusalem before, but this time he's coming in with a mission. And when he comes in with the mission, he's allowing this to happen. Now, why would he come in on a court? Because most times when conquering kings came in, They came in on, right, they came in with processions. There was all this fanfare without going uh, into it this morning. But you came in on a, you came in on a, you know, on a steed. You came in on a, on a horse. And I don't know, some of you, I don't know if anybody here is horse people. If you've ever been around a very large horse, it is intimidating. Um, This is not what he chose to do. But there's a reason for this because Jesus is, is, is doing this to show, yes, I'm coming in, but I'm coming in on a small horse. I'm coming in on a donkey. Why is that? Because the current leadership didn't have any humility. I do have all authority. I do have all power. And at any time, Jesus could, right? We say, oh, he, but he left. He put down his power to come to earth. So we see that Jesus comes in this way, and it fulfills the prophecy in Zechariah. In Zechariah, Zechariah nine nine says this: "Greatly rejoice, greatly, daughter of Zion! Shout, your King comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, a fold of a donkey." And so, what Jesus is doing here when he comes in, he's contrasting his authority and leadership in the kingdom with the current leadership. 
This is the way God works. Where the current leadership, even with the little power, even with the Roman occupation, was very top down. My way is Yahweh, you know, <laughs> is the way it was. And Jesus was saying, it's not that way. So he comes in this way. Jesus is a king. He has all authority. Then we come to this next story, right? So he establishes him as king. Now we, he establishes as the high priest. Jesus enters Jerusalem, Mark 11, 11, 14. And he went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. Then the next day, as they were leaving for Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say this, right? So now this is a story, maybe you've heard the, this story before and you go, so Jesus curses a tree, right? So the temptation is to think Jesus is the magic man, right? It's like, oh, Jesus, like, I curse this, I do this, like, I, I speak things into existence, like I have powers. That's not what's happening here. Jesus comes into Jerusalem as a king to set up authority. He's, gonna, he's going after the temple. And just before he does that, he goes to the temple, looks around, and he goes, not enough people here. <laughs> and he leaves. We'll go back at it when this place is full. And then when they're going out the next morning, he sees a fig tree. Well, why would he, what does he have against this fig tree? And somebody owns this fig tree more than likely. And he curses it. He goes, this seems just like these biblical stories. No, here's the purpose. So fig trees, um, there's, there's a lot with the fig trees. So it's, it's not, it's, it would feel confusing, but really what's happening is this. He goes over to the fig tree, he sees it, it's leafy. Usually fig trees in the spring, they would sprout their leaves. And actually there's two harvests, there's, there's two kind of fruit seasons uh, for, for fig trees. It, in the, in the, it, there's an early cross crop that it produces right around Passover. And they're just really small little, little guys. And then it comes into full fruit like in the, like right now, the end of September. And so when he sees the leafy tree, that usually means that, that, that this tree is full of life. When he walks over to it, there's nothing there. He is, the tree is a picture of the temple. And he says, it looks like it has fruit, but there is no fruit. And some, some scholars actually speculate that, that once that tree isn't producing fruit, that it is actually a fruitless tree and it will never produce fruit again. And so Jesus is saying, what's the fig tree? The fig tree, as he goes into the temple, he's like, do you know what this fig tree's like? This fig tree's like this temple. It looks like it's gonna produce fruit. It's bushy, it's great, but there's no fruit coming from it. They're not sharing, the temple is not sharing the blessing of God to all the nations around it. They're not even taking care of their own people. It's become inward focused. So Jesus curses it. And this is, in, 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 he imagine in full stride going to the temple to go, I'm done with the temple. He is the king of kings. He comes and he looks, he goes, the temple is now holding back God's word. So he, cur so he curses it, right? Now understand, understand what a fig tree meant. So when we think of Adam and Eve in the garden, we think of like, they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what is our culture? What tr kind of tree is that? Anybody? Yeah, people we think of as an apple tree. Back in the day, do you know what kind of tree they thought it was? A fig tree. It was a knowledge of good and evil. Why? Because if you go back to Genesis, when Adam and Eve ate of the fruit, they all of a sudden discovered that they were naked. And what did they sew together? They sewed together fig leaves. So the natural inclination was, oh, fig tree. So, so don't eat a fig tree. That's what I'm really trying to say here. Please, let's all just agree, no. Um, so, so you understand the rich history when, when he calls out the fig tree that's supposed to be do, producing fruit, the one that was in the very garden, that symbol of that was, was very deep, right? So the, yeah, and so 
Jesus, I say this as, a, as, as his office of a priest, he is the one, if he's the priest, the high priest, he is the one that can actually call the temple leadership out. He's the high priest, right? He's the one that can, he's the one who actually has the authority to do it. So not only see him as the king of kings, but even in this, we see him going, no, 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 this is wrong. Well, who, yeah, everybody, you, everybody has an opinion, right? No, 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 no. Jesus is the high priest. And he is, you know, um, he's the only, he is the only one. And why I, yeah, um, he, he's the only one that can actually, that actually has the authority to do what he's about to do. Um, something else happens. We're going to read through another passage in the temple, but then Mark comes back to the fig tree. And so what happens is, he tells the story of the triumphant entry. He tells the story of the fig tree. Then he tells the story of, of Jesus in the temple. And then he goes back to the fig tree. So what is, what's that about? Here's what it's about. Anytime they say things two or three times in the Bible, two times for emphasis, it always means like, don't miss this, okay? Three times, only, I think we all know it, holy, holy, holy. One of the only times it's used three times. Two times is huge point of emphasis, highlight it. But when they, when, they, when they sandwich it, there's something here and there's expression there. That means what is in the middle is highlighted. So that's highlighted, but what's in between those is highlighted. Because in verse 20, after, every, after everything we're going to go through, it says, in the morning as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. And Peter remembered what Jesus says. And Luke says, hey, and he says, I love this. Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed is withered, you know? He's like, so that's the, that's the words of Jesus, almost like, Jesus, look at that. I can't believe it happened, but it, it really does. So we see that he comes as, a, comes as a king. He comes as a high priest. He says, the temple is dead. I'm in. I'm coming with authority, right? Because you have to imagine his ministry. Remember, remember Jesus' mom all the time was like, when are you going to do, get at your ministry? Mom, my time has not yet come. Well, just... Your friends are embarrassed in the wedding. Go do something. You know you can do something about it. And that was his first miracle. So Jesus finally stepping up, stepping up into it after three years. And then we have our last passage we're coming to, where Jesus becomes a prophet. Those are the three offices, king, priest, prophet. And a prophet was somebody um, who just didn't tell the truth, like some are... He, sometimes you say, who wants a prophet? They're like, oh, that's somebody who, who like told the future. It's not a fortune teller. It's someone who told the truth. It's someone who God picked out to say, you are going to be the one who speaks my words and my words only. And so they not only spoke them and the history of Israel is the, the prophets would actually live that out. They would rename their children. I mean, one of the prophets in order to get a message to Israel, not a joke, he walks around the city naked <laughs> for a long time to say, do you understand what's happening? They would actually live the message out so no one could miss it. And then we, so we come to this story of Jesus. It says, on reaching Jerusalem, Jesus enters the temple courts and, and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturns the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. The chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. The chief priest and the teachers of the law, uh, I'm sorry, and when evening came, his disciples went out of the city, right? And so there's a couple things that happen here, right? We know it. Jesus goes in and he turns, every, he turns everything over. Um, do we, um, can we bring up the picture of the temple? So you have to, I'll, I'll, I'll say, so here's a picture of, of Herod's temple. And if you can see, sorry, you'll see these huge areas over here. This is, this is, this is, this is the best resolution I could get. Sorry, I apologize, All right? This was no, known as the court of the Gentiles, you can see that these courts are the biggest ones. And then this is the interior and this is the temple and the holy place and the holy of holies is right here. Um, 
But this is the place where they would be selling and they would be buying. It was the court of the Gentiles. It was the largest area. So when Jesus comes in here, oh, at, at Passover, um, they would, um, from lambs to doves, it would be hundreds and thousands of animals and animal sacrifices. Um, we have some, some, like, there's a Jewish historian, Josephus, that actually, you know, at some Passover puts actual numbers to it that are pretty, pretty legit. So you can imagine hundreds and if not thousands of people through here that Jesus comes into the court, and it's the court of the Gentiles. This is the only place, if you, weren't, if you weren't somebody, if you weren't Jewish, this is as far as you could come. But this was a place that was set out for, for you. And almost everybody in this room, all of us, that's as far as we could have gone. So Jesus in teaching, right? He turns over everything because he has, see, he taught them and it's, so let me read this to you again. Is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations? And you've made it a den of robbers. You've used the blessing for yourself where, where the temple, he's standing in the court of the Gentiles saying that the gospel was to be a blessing to all the Gentiles. And a lot of the conservative people back then, religious people were like, oh, I thought we were supposed to go to war and fight. We we're supposed to get rid of the Gentiles. That's what we thought Messiah would be. And instead, Jesus is saying the opposite. So for those of you who are curious, it's a fast, to me, that's a fascinating study to go through. But Jesus as a prophet is living out the story. He's showing them. It's funny that if somebody came into your business and knocked over things, you probably would have something to say about it. But the thing I think we miss here is we take the action of him being a prophet, show, you know, showing, you know, live, living out the message that this is supposed to be about prayer, not about buying and selling goods um, to keep people right with God. And he spends the entire day teaching. He gets there in the morning, but most of the day he spends teaching. And, it, you know, kind of buried in this is they're saying the chief priest, we want to figure out a way to kill him, but we can't do it. Why? Everybody's listening to him. It'll be a bad look. We got to figure out another way to do this. Jesus' passion is for the temple to be, at that time, the temple was supposed to be the blessing to all nations. But instead, they were holding it to themselves. You know, this is the history of, this is the history of the church. And it's easy for us to fall into this. You see, what happened after Jesus rose from the dead, it's, it's rose from the dead, he told his followers to go. Stay in Jerusalem, the Holy Spirit goes, then you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the ends of the earth. That's the plan. You know, most of the disciples, they went to the ends of the earth. We don't hear actually much about the church in Jerusalem, even though it was the strong church after Jesus died. We hear about Paul going to all these small towns in these little churches because that's where God was moving, to the ends of the earth. To, and into cities that people were like, oh, they would never. Ephesus? Corinth? Oh, Christians in Corinth, right. Yeah, no. It actually happened. These are cities that the, the, the average religious person in the Jewish faith would say, these are far away. And God goes, we need to go reach those people. And so it spreads throughout the Roman Empire. And we actually have documents from like, from Roman, from, you know, extra, like Romans, you know, um, you know, mayors writing other Roman, you know, constables about the Christian problem because the faith starts to spread. And we know that within a few hundred years, all of a sudden Christianity becomes the majority faith in the Roman empire. Right? And you go, oh, that's fantastic. Can you believe it? Well, but here's the thing. The Romans, they hated the barbarians. You know, the dirty forest people from Germany where my ancestors are from. And so they never shared the faith with them. They just fought them. 
But over years and people going back and forth and slaves, all of a sudden, those people come to faith. And so a few hundred years later, they have the Christian faith. But you know what? They, they won't share it with those Vikings. Those people are ungodly. I mean, they take pride in coming down and raiding like churches and, you know, monasteries and, right? And so it gets worse until enough Nordics take away enough Christians as slaves that the good news of God starts to impact them. Everywhere it goes, we hold it to ourselves. And, and yet, then in church history, we have these other beautiful times where God starts working and we have this time, the great awakening, and all of a sudden people go all over the world. There's an explosion of people going into Africa for missions. And the stats were two out of five people that go will die from malaria, from a disease, from something. And you know what happens? More, like more college students keep going. We have these times where people, go, people sacrifice to go into China. Is it perfect? No. Do they bring Jesus with them? Yes. Do they bring part of their culture with them? Absolutely. And some do it, some do it a lot better than others. But the point was, is that every place the gospel went on its own, we see peace and we see, we see God moving. This was always God's design that we'd be a blessing to all nations. So as we leave and you see these things, this is why Jesus not just went to the cross, but he went to make sure the gospel didn't stay in one place. It was to go everywhere. So now that we have the gospel, now that you and I have the good news, this good news can transform us. It takes people that are enemies and turns them to brothers and sisters. It takes people that are addicted and changes their life. It renews families. It takes... It takes grudges that have been held for centuries and they just evaporate. It takes people that should have nothing in common and places them in families and people without families. So my question is this, are, are you holding the good news of God to yourself? We live in a culture that says, well, it's, they won't really understand it. They'll put me in a, they'll put me in a, you know, put me on the shelf if I talk about this. We have neighbors. God's placed each of us in these places of your work, your neighborhood, right? And our families. And none of them, all of them are messy. And he says, but God has such a heart for the people that we're with that he says, if you line up with me, you'll see what I will do. God has a desire to reach people that you and I sometimes go, I don't have a desire to reach any of these people. Why did Jesus go to the cross? It was for our own personal salvation? Yeah. But it was also for us to take that good news to everybody. And we don't want to be, we don't want to be a church where we say, like, we exist to, right, love God, love people, and serve the world. It's almost like, being on an airplane, it's like, take your mask. If it falls up, we're like, yes, put on your mask first, right? We don't want to become a church that says that, so we think we're doing it. We want to become a church individually. Are you holding the good news to yourself? The people that follow in this direction, that's where we have our God stories. So when we hold it to ourselves, we're like, I don't really experience God. It's not that, that's, it's, it's one of the best tests to do that. But when we walk in God's direction, that's where, and we're, we're praying for our neighbors. I don't know what to do, God, but I'm just going to walk around my neighborhood. I'm going to pray for them, right? That's where all of a sudden you'll have stories like, you're not going to believe what happened. I was walking in the store and I was in that. A lady came out and she said that. She had a dog and whatever it is. And then God works. And it doesn't mean you have to go door to door, but it's just the simple prayer. And so as we come to communion, here's my, here's my, my, my challenge. Instead of praying, a lot of times when we pray to God, it's easy to say, God, would you work in this area, this area, this area? This week, would you try this? Every area of your heart's concerned, every area where God has established you relationally, school, classroom, dorm, right? 
workplace, Zoom, surrender it to him. Right? Ah, my brother is a pain in the rear end. God, instead of saying, would you fix him? Go, God, I surrender my brother to you. I have a hard relationship with my children sometimes. I give them to you. God works when we surrender things to him. God, I don't know how to reach my neighbors. I, I give that to you. Let me surrender it to you. Would you show me? Bring the people into my life. So everything you struggle with, everything that's on your heart, everything you're unconcerned, that little shift, that, that shift from, God, would you work in this area, which is a good prayer, to God, I just, let me just give it to you, surrender. Let me take my hands off of it. God, I, I'm concerned about my finances. Surrender it to him. He's given you all of it. He can give you more. He says, go with me. My hope is that as a church, that we will encourage each other to not hold the blessing to ourselves. And as we come to communion, know that that surrender is that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And while your neighbors are far away from God, God loves them and he died for them. The people that are aggressively against God died for them and loves them in every opportunity. So as we come to communion this morning, as we take the bread and we take the cup, know that the, bo the broken body of Jesus is broken for you, me, and everyone who will accept it. His blood covers all of our short sightings. It cancels out the sin that all of us have. And it's so easy. Don't beat yourself up this morning because you're holding the blessing to yourself is when we look at Jesus clearly, it's the only time where we can break out of that kind of, you know, um, you know, tacit underneath the surface selfishness and say, I love what the gospel does to me, but who am I to tell you how to live your life? Um, this morning, uh, as we pray, we form two lines. You can dip it in, uh, take bread and dip it in, or um, the, uh, the juice, or you can also take a cup back uh, to your... Um, uh, your seat with you. But let me know that God moved heaven and earth to reach you and me with the good news. Let's right, ask him this week, how does he want to use you to reach all the, to reach the people that he's strategically placed in your life? Let's pray. Father, thank you for um, that you love people in such a way that uh, we don't have a category to put it in. Thank you that you came to earth and set aside your glory. But Jesus, as we walked through these stories this morning, would we see that let us not fall into the place where we become like uh, the temple, holding, holding your good news and blessing to ourselves. Thank you that uh, you are a God who loves us, and would you fill us with your love that might we, with excitement and even risk, share and do whatever it we need to do to let people know that you treasure them also. And we pray this, Father, in the name of Jesus. Amen.
Church, as we continue on and, and sing our final song, I want to remind you that um, we have prayer in the back, and Gordon is back there and would love to pray with you, pray for you. If there's anything that God has been putting on your heart, somebody that you want to share the good news with, or something that you have to surrender to him, um, prayer is available for you in the back. But let's continue to praise God that he is mighty to save, that he is worthy of all praise, and we'll give him this glory today.
church, as we close, would you receive this benediction? May you therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe and obey all that Jesus has commanded us. Shine your light and let the whole world see the glory of Jesus, our King. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. Church, thanks for joining us. Yeah.